Our first guest graduated from biomedical engineering in Broden, oh, in Brno, and continue into general medicine in Olomouc. As a Fulbright scholar, he received PhD from the Center of Neuroscience, University of Pittsburgh. He completed postdoctoral training in the Human Neuroscience Laboratory at the University of Chicago. And following his return to the Czech Republic, neurology residency at the Department of Neurology, Platsky University Medical School. He has been involved in a number of projects of the Faculty of Theology, uh, namely of its one part called Olomouc University Social Health Institute. Uh, they are with us at the Faculty of Theology, though they do the hard science, biomarkers, quantitative and qualitative research. Those are quite two worlds together. Uh, we do not understand all the time each other, but we like each other. His, resid uh, his research has focused on studying the human motor and somatosensory system and their plasticity using functional magnetic resonant imaging. Translated into understandable language. Uh, when I see Professor Ginter Verd here, uh, Professor Roman Globokar, Professor Piotr Morciniec and others. Our next guest is also a keen mountain climber. Please welcome Professor Petr Hluštík. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you, uh, Dominic, for the kind introduction, and thank you for bringing me to this uh, to this conference and to this audience. I wish I could um, join your meeting yesterday, but I was at another conference from my own field uh, in Prague. So, um, so sorry for that, but uh, I hope um, I will be able to um, tell you something interesting uh, because of your different backgrounds. So uh, the topic uh, Dominic and I agreed to, um, for me to, to address was, uh, as you see the title, what can neuroscientists tell us, brain injuries and their impact on behavior. Uh, you've actually heard uh, something about my background and education. Um, I wasn't sure how much of this introduction will, um, will sound uh, to you. So um, I put something on my slide that, uh, I'm actually quite far away from, uh, from the topic of this meeting um, in terms of today's um, approach, fragmentation of science and super specialization. So within the broad field of neurosciences, I'm uh, mostly um, studying the sensory motor system. So how we control, uh, control movement and also how the body uh, responds back. Uh, to, to adapt and adjust uh, control of our movements. And I'm very interested in plasticity or changes in the adult brain uh, due to training or also neurological injury, um, and changes in afferentation, which is the, the feedback that comes from the body back to the brain. Uh, I, the, so this is the major area. Um, and a minor area, uh, we also did some studies uh, of, from the domain of language, uh, working memory, and emotions, because one of my uh, PhD students, former PhD students, is a psychiatrist and psychotherapist, so we uh, studied something uh, about uh, per perception of emotion from the face. But still, as you can see, there is nothing, nothing about morality and judgment and uh, uh, even violence, even though I will be uh, presenting data to you on that topic. So, uh, so just uh, be aware of, of these limitations when we uh, then discuss. And of course, um, as far as morality, I also uh, searched my, uh, my memory um, about what, uh, what um, starting points that I have there. And there is, of course, even more limited. Even though I'm a practicing Catholic Christian, uh, what came to my mind was, of course, that the story of Genesis uh, 2 and 3 about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, as, as the story goes, as you know, was not 
uh, totally uh, seemed not to be really planned to be uh, to be uh, approached by by humans, uh, but then nevertheless they they ate the fruit of of this tree and. Uh, so, so for me, that uh, from the beginning, it's uh, a complicated message that um, um, was partly um, the free will of of the humans um, gaining this, and then of course at the uh, the end of of uh, um, the Bible. So in the New Testament, uh, there is this reminder in the in the uh, story of the wheat of the wheat and the wheat that um, uh, the the slaves or the servants should not go and gather the weeds that are among the wheat because as, as you see since in gathering the weeds you may uproot the wheat uh, with them so so that's another uh, reminder that um, moral judgments especially when it comes to other people are not so easy so enough for that um, so i i thought um, when when i was approached by dominic uh, what what i could really share and that's uh, really uh, fragments and pieces that come from my neuroscience education partly and uh, partly I also have pretty much heard by accident. Uh, so this is the outline. Um, and so there is three basically topics that I will I will go through. Uh, some of them you may know that's that's my that's my limitation that I don't really know your backgrounds and how much uh, you know about this. Um, about these medical cases and so on. So um, uh, it's possible that I will uh, repeat something that you know very well. Uh, so that's um, this um, gentleman called Phineas Gage, which, I'm, which uh, whom I will be, uh, whom I will introduce to you. Then there is the issue of, of serious crime. So looking uh, from the opposite end, um, not at person and then injury and then what happens. This is looking at people who already. Uh, um, uh, committed the most serious crimes and somebody thought about looking at their brains and see whether there is anything anything wrong with the brains and then uh, a really minor point that i discovered uh, when i was preparing this talk um, uh, that aggressiveness and even homicidality which i really didn't know um, may also appear in, in infectious diseases um, such as lyme disease infectious disease or the brain so um, introduction uh, <clears throat> when you go through uh, neurological and psychiatric literature um, as the history um, goes then there were several reports of patients with brain damage who uh, manifested um, behavior that was either socially inappropriate insensitive and then towards the more dramatic and aggressive or violent and this was typically when the lesion included the frontal lobe of the brain um, this uh, behavior was uh, called, uh, let's say, by psychiatrists, psychologists, sociopathic. So there was a pathology in dealing uh, within society or dealing with other people and uh, was um, named by an interesting term, acquired sociopathy. Um, then I will give you a few examples. So, so Phineas Gage, um, this really is um, a guy that I was, uh, that I learned about during my uh, neuroscience education in the United States, um, was an American uh, that was injured um, and got, that caused behavioral changes and personality changes. Um, and uh, really in textbook of cognitive neuroscience, uh, when it comes to the front lobe and behavior, uh, he's frequently mentioned right at the beginning uh, even deserving like Phineas Gage and the beginnings of neuropsychology. Neuropsychology meaning the um, field which looks at uh, deficits due to lesions of the brain, both in uh, psychology and neurology. Uh, so <clears throat> I actually, when I was um, gathering details uh, for, this, uh, for this topic, I learned some new things myself because as, as you, um, look at me and my my neuroscience education my phd is a few years ago already so so um, um i added in discovered interesting additional data when when i was preparing the material like for example this this picture of phineas gage on the right 
that was discovered, I think, in, 19, in 2009. And I will not tell you the whole story, but it was quite an accident that uh, for a hundred and, I don't know, 50 years, we didn't know um, how this famous patient, what, what he looked like. And um, this was matched uh, by kind of detective work that uh, it's actually him and this is after his injury, uh, which you can tell uh, from the look of, of his face and his closed left eye because he uh, became also blind. Um, and the, the tool that he is holding is actually the tool that, that injured him or, or his head and, and brain. And uh, they, they were able to, looking at the photograph in high resolution, uh, find out a um, piece of his name, which confirmed his identity. So, so when, the, when the memorable ac accident happened, so he was 25 years old, as you can see, um, literate, healthy and strong, um, uh, and uh, was working for a railroad company and was considered very efficient and capable, smart, energetic, persistent, fulfilling his assigned job duties. Uh, I have read all this because you, you can guess that th this uh, wasn't true after his injury. And then um, he was a foreman, so like I was, had some other people on duty um, serving under him. <clears throat> and uh, on this September day, uh, he was uh, working on a railroad construction in Vermont, USA, um, uh, applying explosives to clear the rock. And um, Unfortunately, there was something wrong. Supposedly, somebody talked to him or something, so he was uh, not fully concentrated. And um, he, <clears throat> uh, with this with this rod, which was called tamping iron, he actually instead of tamping on some like earth covering the explosive, he tamped the directly uh, on the on the explosive itself, and there was a spark ignited, and and then this piece of iron uh, flew from the ground up and through actually his face and his skull and damaging his brain. Um, it actually flew 25 meters um, far, far away. So it was quite a, quite a, quite a strong, uh, quite a flight and strong force. And um, he fell on his back uh, as, as the reports go and had a few um, twitches of his extremities. And I got up and spoke with uh, within a few minutes uh, with some assistance. He walked and was taken by a cart uh, back to his lodgings in the nearby village. Uh, he lost the vision in the left eye. And uh, then there was a quite a, quite a um, uh, complicated, serious uh, wound infection. But his, his uh, doctor who treated him was excellent in this and um, actually helped him survive. Um, a later research, uh, which I will say something about it also, um, and recent 3D reconstruction of his preserved skull show that the iron likely destroyed most of his brain's left front lobe. Um, Harlow, which is his uh, physician at the time who saved his life by, by treating the wound infection and brain infection, um, reports that he regained his physical strength, manifested no deficit in movement or speech, and was able to learn new information. So his memory or intelligence seemed unaffected. Uh, the picture on the, on the right is uh, from um, a, an article by, uh, by David Ferrier about localization of uh, brain function. And um, actually, maybe I don't have it in the, um, in the text, but um, he died in California, so on the west coast of the USA. And his, uh, there was no autopsy, so his body and his brain was not directly examined but the physician got permission of his family and went and exhumed his body and got his skull. So the skull is now in, in, in Boston in the Anatomical Museum of Harvard University. And uh, this is a reconstruction of, of the path of the iron through his, through his head uh, from the time, so from the 19th century papers. Um, okay, so what else happened to Gage? Uh, his personality changed, and um, the physician wrote he's now fitfully irreverent, indulging at times in the, in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, and that his friends found him no longer gauge, um, and he no longer showed the former balance of his intellectual faculties and animal propensities, uh, would not keep plans and arrangements, uh, so he became totally unreliable and um, for his fellows, he had little deference. 
So um, he showed little of the former respect for social conventions and completely lost his sense of, of responsibility. Um, because of this, uh, when he recovered, he tried to get his job back, but the company uh, knew about his uh, changes and so did not uh, did, did refuse to employ him back. Um, he actually got some jobs uh, later on and never reached his former position and uh, moved to San Francisco and died at the age of 36 um, after a series of seizures, probably suffering from something called post-traumatic epilepsy. So when there is a brain damage, brain trauma, uh, often the brain tissue during healing, and unfortunately, uh, well, if I can call it the wiring of the brain, uh, becomes uh, malfunctioning and there is uh, synchronization of electrical activity giving a rise to, uh, to um, seizures or epilepsy and uh, this may be um, actually even leading to death. Um, then eight years after his death and 20 years after the accident, uh, this, his physician wrote another paper and uh, put more reflection into the relationship between the brain damage and uh, the behavioral uh, changes and also um, uh, putting more thought into recovering the trajectory of the iron through the skull and through the head and what parts of the brain were actually damaged. Um, he speculated that, uh, that the brain lesion was the cause for the, uh, for the uh, behavioral uh, changes. And, and um, this was actually much more surprising, this was just the time when uh, localization of brain function was uh, beginning. There were studies on uh, language uh, localization in um, France and Germany, uh, Broca and Wernicke. Uh, but those, uh, even those, even though they were uh, discussed because it was a quite a new thing. And, uh, but this was even, even more challenging and uh, hard to accept for the neurologists and psychologists of the time that uh, lesion of the brain might actually also cause such behavioral changes and changes in judgment and uh, behavior, so social behavior. And um, as I read the literature, the medical environment was really not ready for this. And because reasoning and social behavior were strongly linked to ethics. So here comes the keyword and religion and so could not be subject of medical inquiry and explanation. There was only one, the guy who I mentioned, David Ferrier, who uh, put the picture of the skull in his paper, one defender of, of, of Harlow um, and um, his conclusions or his reasoning. And then there was um, a long uh, period where um, Actually, the Gage's story was told and retold and partially distorted um, by, by repeating and adding facts that were not uh, part of the in in original report. As far as science, um, when new technology became available, uh, then um, American neurologists and uh, neuropathologists took advantage of the skull and modern technology and did 3D reconstructions. Um, on the skull that, as I said, is in Harvard um, Anatomical Museum and uh, then put a brain in the skull and uh, confirmed what, what areas of the brain were really, this was on the cover of the journal Science because it was again attracted attention. And um, then the, the modern reconstruction uh, concluded um, or describe the very specific parts of the brain that were very likely damaged in gauge. And that was uh, the, the gray matter, especially the gray matter of the internal part of the, of the front lobe of the brain and on the bottom. Uh, so uh, called uh, orbitofrontal cortex because there is the orbit, you know, the, uh, the eye socket and on top of that um, lies this piece of, of the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. Um, by the time, of course, there were other patients with frontal lobe damage, uh, with other mechanisms of injury, stroke, tumors, and uh, this was already accepted, uh, of course, that, uh, that um, damage to this region uh, is important for, or this region is important for em emotion-based decision-making in the social context, and also that it moderates aggression, so in, in damage, uh, the aggressive behavior becomes deliberated. 
Um, so um, now I'm switching to um, the second um, item um, so on my on my list on my outline, which is, as I said already, the opposite approach. Uh, there were a neurologist and a psychiatrist in the United States in the 1980s, and I heard this from my colleagues while uh, in the USA, um, and that they, their names were uh, um, Lewis and Jonathan Pincus was the neurologist. And they thought about um, getting approval from the authorities and visiting the prisons with the, with the most serious uh, law offenders who were sentenced to death in the United States. So as you know, not, not every country uh, has death penalty, but, but uh, US still, still have it. And so, um, so they, they um, did examinations. Uh, the, so the hypothesis was that perhaps there is also something wrong with the brain um, of these people that uh, might somehow uh, contribute to, to their behavior being so, so extreme that, uh, that actually the, the law system um, uh, gives them death as the punishment. So they, they um, went around and collected um, two series of patients uh, of adults and uh, young people and um, also looked at uh, forensic psychiatric inpatients of people who were considered insane and not, not responsible for the crimes, but uh, committing serious crimes uh, anyway, and uh, other people. So there were other, of course, and other researchers who took the same approach. Um, and they did actually find uh, psychiatric, neurological, and cognitive disorders in, in most of these patients. There was still some controversy uh, so because other other people uh, looking at in different countries looking at this population claim that it's by far not so bad. Um, but after this, uh, the obvious question was: uh, Do these findings of of brain damage, uh, psychiatric, neurological disease, uh, somehow uh, mitigate or excuse their criminal conduct? Um, specifically in the 1986 study, uh, the, the psychiatrist and neurologist uh, presented uh, 15 uh, death row inmates, all had suffered severe head injuries in childhood, about half have been injured by assaults, and six were chronically psychotic um, in terms of psychiatry. And um, of course, uh, this was not uh, the people who, who very favored death penalty and serious punishment said, oh, no, no, they, they, they were just, you cannot believe their memories and their stories because they, they want to uh, find excuse and uh, avoid death penalty. But the psychiatrist uh, said in an, in, an, in, in an interview that this was actually the opposite. Uh, they uh, minimized or denied their psychiatric disorders and their injuries and um, figuring out that it was better to be bad than crazy and they couldn't even remember so they had to uh, really question them and get it out of the, their memory and the, uh, the relatives memory uh, so uh, apparently this was not uh, there from the beginning that they would use as the uh, cause for uh, defense and uh, the the other study the other collection was uh, even ju juveniles uh, so uh, let's say from the point of uh, um, behavior and uh, acceptable norms, even the more more extreme that even even young people are already so so uh, changed that they commit these uh, crimes, and they all had suffered head trauma, mostly in car accidents, but also beatings and physical abuse and sodomy. Um, so, um, as far as um, brain findings, uh, it turned out that. Again, the frontal lobe was the most commonly uh, lesion structure um, and the dysfunction has been cited to explain these, uh, the acts of at least some of these uh, people engaged in violent crim criminal behavior. And so the theory is this, uh, this orbital frontal cortex um, normally inhibits impulsive, inappropriate or habitual aggression and when damaged, it, it fails to do so. And, um, the imaging that uh, there was done by in these patients were initially a so-called computed tomography, uh, an x-ray technique available since the 1970s. 
but then later on a more sensitive techniques based on so-called uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, phenomenon uh, so called mri in the medical uh, environment uh, magnetic resonance imaging became available and then also something called positron emission tomography which is a functional method that doesn't look at structure of the brain but uh, at metabolism and other functional parameters uh, so it can look at even softer deficits that may not be uh, visible when looking just at the structure of the brain. They all documented uh, structural and functional uh, changes of the brain in these, um, in these um, people. Um, I have one case report that I found uh, only recently when preparing for this that, uh, that really uh, is good enough. The professor Greeley is a, is a law professor, but um, um, deals with this issue of, of brain damage and violence and law. And so the case goes like this, the middle-aged um, man, this was published in the medical literature as well, not only in the law. And um, uh, in Virginia has led a normal life. Uh, as you can see, I'm just reading it. This is a, a kind of reworked quote from Professor Greeley. Without ever showing any deep interest in pornography, in his early 40s, he developed an interest in child pornography. Um, shortly thereafter, unfortunately, he behaved inappropriately with his 12-year-old stepdaughter, seriously enough that he was actually uh, um, arrested and convicted. As a first-time offender, uh, he didn't go to jail immediately. He was sent to a diversion program, but he failed because he propositioned everyone he saw. Uh, so, um, so he failed. He couldn't uh, participate in this, and then the only, uh, the only operative, the only solution was uh, the actual prison. The day before he came to court, because he was uh, like this, as you know, this uh, U.S. law system has the um, one dealing in the court is about crime, the other is about punishment. It's a separate, a separate deal. So, uh, but then he went to an emergency room complaining of a terrible headache. Uh, he was admitted to psychiatry, and first they thought it was nothing wrong with was with the brain, except um, because of the stress and um, the, the upcoming court appearance um, caused the headache. But actually, they did send him eventually to an MRI scan of the brain, uh, which revealed a tumor, and um, that's at the bottom. Uh, so. Finally, now you have a, a picture of the brain. And um, if you remember, where is the pointer? No. Sorry. Okay. Just, of course, uh, hearing a neurologist. Uh, I have to cannot resist uh, pointing something about the brain, which you may not be so interested in about. Oh, sorry, I should speak to this. Uh, so um, you can probably also have to learn how to work with this. It's this little thing. I Yo, um, um, does this work? No, sorry. I'm learning how to operate this technology. I apologize, I should have practiced this before, but... Um... Uh, well, the, the third picture, the, so the picture on the on the very right uh, has the bright um, uh, bright spot towards the top of the picture and inside the head <laughs> so the bright spot this is the tumor and um, okay um, yeah I can actually use this so that, that bright spot um, the bright spot, sorry, the bright spot uh, uh, in the front of the head is, is this bottom part of the frontal lobe called the orbital frontal cortex. So it actually fits very well with the story that I told you. 
so surgeons removed this tumor and the man claimed to have lost all interest in pornography child or adult. So he didn't go to jail, took the diversion program, this time passed easily um, and tried to rebuild his life. Um, about a year later, um, he again developed a headache and again began secretly collecting pornography. Another CT scan, which I am not showing you, showed that the tumor has grown back. Uh, it was once again removed by surgery and again, he had no more disturbing impulses. So Professor Greeley, being a lawyer, of course, look, he looks at this from his perspective and asks, if that's the defendant in front of you, uh, talking to lawyers, as a prosecutor, a judge, or a parole board, what do you do with him and why? The law will have to decide how to handle such offenders. Um, so that's um, as far as the second point, looking at, um, uh, looking at people committing, committing crimes. And then the third and shortest point is, um, uh, as I found recently, um, just looking at this, uh, there are even uh, non-traumatic, I actually show you a tumor already, but uh, the most common uh, cause of these, um, of these behavioral changes is trauma, but uh, tumors is the second case. There were some uh, stroke uh, cases also reported, but uh, actually even to me, this was a surprise that um, Lyme disease, which is an infection quite common in North America and Europe, um, is a multi-system bacterial infection uh, transmitted by ticks. Um, this one can also change behavior and uh, cause aggressiveness. So the, the, this infection is um, called multi-system because um, it, uh, it begins on the skin and manifests on the skin first. And if that's the only uh, system um, that is, if, is affected, it's easy, it's treated by antibiotics and, and the patient is cured. Unfortunately, in some patients, it's not caught so uh, early and then, then it, uh, the infection develops and um, damages other organs, including the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. This is only about 10 to 15% of patients. Um, and uh, to my surprise, a psychiatrist uh, somehow in interested in this question, uh, an American psychiatrist uh, began collecting uh, patients, even getting them referred from other hospitals who manifested behavioral changes. And uh, first he noticed increased suicidality and then uh, because they did comprehensive uh, testing, uh, even homicidality and aggressiveness. Um, the papers I read, uh, the one was a retrospective analysis of 1000 uh, Lyme disease patients. Um, I would say this is not any 1000 patients. These are those that were referred to a psychiatrist. So that's already, um, let's say a very, very small subset, maybe 1% or even less um, of the patients. And out of those 1000, about 10% had had um, actually homicidal thoughts or as some of them actually committed, committed murder. Uh, the delay was nine years from the onset of the disease. So the, the, the disease develops over years if it's not treated uh, in the early phase. And then as a psychiatrist, um, he describes the symptoms that it was mostly impulsive behavior, intrusive symptoms, uh, sometimes sensory stimulations. They were very sensitive to certain smells kind of bizarre um, behavioral and, and psychiatric changes uh, caused by this disease. And uh, also has a list of, of psychiatric uh, symptoms at the bottom. So I already mentioned suicidality, sudden abrupt mood swings, explosive anger, paranoia, anhedonia. Uh, you are, most of you probably from the social sciences, but I, I guess these terms being uh, Greek and Latin uh, it make some sense to you. Hypervigilance, exaggerated startle, that's uh, like the <laughs> response when, when you hear a loud noise or uh, normally people jump. So that's the startle response. Disinhibition nightmares, depersonalization, intrusive aggressive images, dissociative episodes, and the list actually is even longer. 
the de derealization that's already like psychiatric symptoms uh, for psych parts of psychosis being disconnected from reality. Intrusive sexual images, marital family problems, legal problems, substance abuse, depression, panic disorder, memory impairments, uh, quite a long list. But out of this, uh, obviously, aggressiveness uh, up to going to uh, kill somebody is, is, is the most serious. And um, so there is a spectrum of these among these thousand people uh, referred to as psychiatrists, there is a spectrum of these um, uh, of these symptoms. And as I said, only only 10 of them, uh, it was in the most serious, uh, most serious consequence, uh, uh, considering or, or committing murder. Um, so this is not saying uh, uh, so the, the incidence of this is, is very low looking at, at the patients as a whole. Uh, but but uh, I think yeah this uh, there is like three thousand cases of Lyme disease in the United States and sixty five thousand cases in Europe per year. So even the, if this affects one person out of ten thousand, it's still it's still um, a serious consideration. Um, so um, looking at these different etiologies, then the neurologist, psychologist, psychiatrist uh, try to put together the contribution of the different brain areas besides uh, the one area I mentioned to the orbital frontal cortex and uh, aggressive behavior that would be a topic of a separate lecture. Uh, this is from Stahl 2014 uh, review that there is normally a balance of, of uh, impulses which of course um, aggression is part of fight for survival so we share that with with uh, animals and it's quite a natural uh, natural thing within limits but then of course it's in humans it's controlled by uh, things like empathy and uh, just uh, morality and uh, considerations of other people. So, so there is a balance of these, uh, let's say, um, impulses to go towards aggression and then other tendencies to control it. And uh, out of the balance, uh, normal behavior arises. So, so some of these areas uh, contribute more to this uh, behavioral control, which is especially uh, the role of the of the front lobe and uh, we'll probably uh, not say much more and that brings me uh, already to the summary so it has long been known that brain injuries and lesions may influence human behavior uh, we have reviewed a few selected examples of socially inappropriate violent or even grave criminal behavior in people who have suffered brain damage and most commonly in the frontal lobe of the brain. These examples <clears throat> raise many questions uh, to maybe uh, to bioethicists, but also in the most serious case to lawyers. And uh, to which degree may this moral or rather immoral behavior be influenced uh, by brain dysfunction and ultimately whether the documented presence of brain damage and dysfunction may mitigate or excuse criminal conduct. As far as I know, right now, uh, like in the United States, um, they still refuse to accept because the, the story is complicated. So uh, some of these defense lawyers try to admit uh, MRI or CT images of brain damage as evidence into the court. And this was uh, this was so far uh, not accepted which makes uh, sense to me and I agree with that just because of the complicatedness of this interpretation but uh, but there is definitely this tension uh, how these uh, how these um, effects should be handled and how these things should be considered and thank you for your attention there is a long list of references most of which were quite new to me and um, I also learned that um, this um, each of these talks will also be um, put into a form of a, a short paper so i'm not finished quite yet but but you will find some more details in the paper when it's when it's finished and thank you for your attention
this lecture will be responded by our second speaker. Uh, when I checked her CV, I realized that she has a very wide range of interests. Uh, and I found one interesting thing in 2005, she established a panel of ethicists for the EU network GeneSkin on behalf of the European Commission Sixth Framework Program Life Sciences, Genomic and Biotechnology for Health. So please welcome Professor Angelika Walser, who comes from Salzburg. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I didn't prepare a PowerPoint presentation and uh, I, I do my best to be as slow as possible so you can follow my comment on the lecture of Peter Lustig. Thank you so much for your lecture and your statement from the perspective of neurology. Um, I uh, want to present a short comment and I gave it the title, what neurosciences cannot tell us. A response from the perspective of theological ethics, just to provoke the debate a little bit. Uh, in fact, Phineas Gage uh, seems to haunt me. A year ago, I was invited at the Dome Academy of Vienna to discuss about a topic the organizers called the current grievances of humanity. One of them, the supposed abolition of the freedom of will caused by neurosciences. My partner in this conversation was Gerhard Benetka, psychologist and dean of the Faculty of Psychology at the Sigmund Freud University in Vienna. Phineas Gage was, of course, one of the central figures of the evening. The whole auditorium, including myself, was fascinated by the accident over 100 years ago, which is used in many popular books to prove that both reasoning and social behavior seem to be a question of brain functions only. Now, let me tell you another story, a story about my daughter. Some years ago, her adolescence crisis at the age of 14 became very obvious. On a sunny day, her class teacher gave me a call to inform me that my daughter had left the area of school together with a girlfriend in a break. She hadn't returned to class, and the teacher wondered if she had gone home. In fact, she didn't arrive, and in the course of the day, I became worried as well. At the end, the whole school was searching for the two girls. The director was informed, and we were highly alarmed. At six o'clock in the evening, I went to see a neighbor who used to be her babysitter in former times, and to my surprise, I met my daughter at the front of her house, relaxed, smiling, talking to the neighbor, and the hands full of shopping bags. I asked her, where the hell have you been all the time? And I felt like doing what good mothers shouldn't do. She said, hey, mom, come on. We felt like going shopping. I simply forgot you. I'm really honest. Two days later, I decided that I needed a book to explain the memory gaps and the strange behavior of a girl who had been quite a socially intelligent child in former times. To my surprise, there were lots of books about this phenomenon written by neuroscientists. I learned about the amygdala, the meaning of the limbic system and the orbital frontal cortex. I learned from a book of a German cognitive de developmental psychologist, Evelyn Krell, the children and adolescents at the age from 6 to 20 are quite similar to Phineas Gage. Although intelligent, they are often not able to predict the long-term consequences of their decisions and live in the moment of their emotions. Evelyn Crowen cites Antonio Damasio's somatic Marcus hypothesis and explains antisocial behavior which is typical for all teenagers with these missing somatic markers. Usually these markers link a special situation with a special emotion and are an essential part of our capacity to meet decisions in a very short time and in a rather intuitive way. 
Thus, they are in fact a kind of neuronal precondition even to our moral decision making. They are a kind of physical signal that gives us a sense of feeling how to decide. Now, according to Prone, many international studies proved that the development of these markers is due to complex restructuring processes of the orbital frontal cortex. Only at the age of 16 to 18, these markers start to develop, and they take many years, up to the age of 25, to reach an adult level. I leave the details, which I cannot report adequately, of course, to the scientists here uh, of neuroscience, and I simply summarize. I learned that the temporary disorders in, in emotion-based decision-making and sometimes destructive behavior of teenagers resulted from the brain. Crone dedicates one chapter of her book to what she calls the social brain and another chapter to what she calls the moral brain. In the chapter about the social brain, she reported about humors affecting the orbital frontal cortex. They can leave the young patient's intellectual abilities absolutely intact, while they destroy the ability to build up friendships with others by antisocial and anti-moral behavior as lying and cheating. Crone reported as well that it takes quite a long time in general until the neural basis allows children to empathize with each other and put themselves in others' shoes. In the chapter about the moral brain, I learned that Lawrence Kohlberg and Jean Piaget's thesis about the development of moral judgment, stating that there is a first level where children do to follow the rules of the adults, and then they go on to higher levels, uh, and, and develop a sense of their own autonomous judgment, that this growing capacity of moral judgment received somehow neuronal confirmation. In order to solve moral dilemma situations, as the famous Heinz dilemma, uh, probably you all know it, uh, you know the case where uh, the, the question if Heinz is allowed to steal a medicine for his wife because she's terminally ill and he cannot afford the medicine, it takes a highly developed neuronal basis to reach the highest autonomous judgment on the so-called post-conventional level. In fact, Crone's book boiled down the question of social behavior and moral decision-making to a question of the development of the brain. So what are the consequences of these findings to me as theological ethicist now? A first comment. Sciences are embedded in a social context, and so is neuroscience. It has become a leading science. It seems to give us the simple explanations we like to hear. It is not my daughter who behaves in a strange way. It is her brain. It was not Phineas Gage, Gage who reacted in a fitful and irreverent way, but his brain. I cannot park my car correctly because I'm a woman and I have a brain with a smaller spatial orientation capacity. My colleague tends to react aggressively from time to time because he has a male prayer and he is simply not able to express his emotions in words. Of course, it is seductive somehow to solve the problem by stimulation of brain areas, as we heard yesterday. Of course, we all know that this is much too simple. The plasticity of the brain and the interactions of our brain with the social environment are well known. But our society likes simple explanations that give us a kind of moral relief. It is not my fault how my daughter is acting. It is the fault of her brain. I cannot do anything about it except for taking her maybe to the neuroscientist. In fact, I think the story of Phineas Gage uh, has, can have another word, a version, uh, which shows that medical evidence does not really prove the fascinating horror story of a lifelong mental impairment. 
maybe the story of Phineas Gage, and this is a question or a thought I had, is more the story of his physicians and colleagues than his own. I don't know. I just know that we all like dualism, be it the body-soul dualism in former times or the body-mind dualism today, in order to be able to control things the way we like. In fact, Damasio's findings, as far as I understood them, prove the contrary of dualism. Emotions, complex physical reactions, which cannot be controlled consciously, are a necessary part of our thinking and our moral decision making. Emotions represent condensed value experiences, summarizes my colleague Michael Rosenberger in his book Frei zu leben. They are carrier of information and as cognitive as any other form of perception. Emotions move the body. The brain becomes aware of them and the Masu calls this awareness a feeling. Thus feelings can be understood as representations of bodily states in the brain. Rational thinking as a precondition for morality depends on emotions, which enable human beings to focus on central values. As we learned from Damasio, it is not the mind which produces feelings, but emotions are an integral part of practical reason. Thus, moral decision-making as a kind of mental emotional activity is bound to neural activity and is realized on the basis of course it is. Of course, we have to be aware of this fact when we talk about the moral capacities of young adults or criminals whose orbital frontal cortex was damaged severely. We cannot expect the highest grade of autonomous decision making and moral responsibility from people who lack a part of their unilateral capacity due to a tumor, an accident, or a trauma. But of course, this does not mean that we have to completely reject the idea of free will and moral responsibility altogether. I don't have the impression that this moral enhancement we were talking about yesterday can integrate the necessity of emotions as reactions to new situations, which can never be fully controlled. And as a moral theologian, I'm convinced that situations which can never be fully controlled or predicted are the indispensable starting point of an individual moral identity. Now, individual moral identity cannot and should not be produced by others who implant their kind of morality in the brain of others. That could, could soon become a horror story. I imagine a world full of polite, well-adapted and nice people. I'm sure that in this world, we wouldn't meet people like Donald Trump, but also no Greta Thunberg, who is highly aggressive, or Martin Luther, or any artist like Vincent van Gogh, maybe not even Jesus Christ. So I think here we touch a new version of drawing the line between moral enhancement and therapy. And of course, drawing this line is very, very difficult. And we are just at the beginning of it, of course. A second comment. Without the brain, everything is nothing. The brain is not everything. This is a quotation from the so-called Memorandum of a Thoughtful Neuroscience published by German neuroscientists in 2014. The authors of this memorandum in 2014 refer to a text written 10 years ago, the Manifest of Neurosciences in 2004, subscribed by leading German neuroscientists as Gerhard Roth and Wolf Singer. This former manifest of 2004 had been a celebration and praise of the success of neurosciences. According to the views of this manifest, neurosciences could finally explain human being. The manifest proclaimed the end of the freedom of will and cited Benjamin Libet's experiments and those of his successes. 
10 years later, and that was interesting to me, 10 years later, the authors sound quite disillusioned and concede that, and I quote here, there are weaknesses in the field of neuroscience theory. And on the other hand, in naturalistic presuppositions and concepts that are not well thought out enough, which make it difficult to build desirable bridges to psychology, philosophy, and cultural studies in the long term. <laughs> the ontological reductionism of human persons to their nervous system had been all too obvious. And the manifest had turned out to be a good example for what happens when neuroscientists naturalize their personal definition of morality, of freedom of the will. In a diploma thesis, my student found out as many definitions of the free will as there are neuroscientists. At least they were expanding and exceeding the classical philosophical definition of the freedom of the will, which you all know, of course, the criteria of alternative options, the criteria of authorship, and the criteria of control. Not only theologians who were not mentioned in the manifest, but philosophers and psychologists have been criticizing the epistemological errors of category and the anthropological reductionism, which is part of at least some of the publications of neuroscience. As a theologian, it was good to read self-critical sentences like, I quote, a reduction of mental processes and mental experiences to neural activity has not yet been demonstrated and is nowhere in sight. So the self-critique opens up, of course, the dialogue, and I'm sure that Walter Schaub will refer to all this later. Uh, the only thing I want to say now is that neural processes are a necessary but not sufficient condition for moral decision-making. The capacity to deal and to cope with certain facts which are part of our contingency and an expression how to deal with the conditional freedom we all experience is not only a question of the brain. Gerhard Kvinetka, whom I mentioned before uh, from the Sigmund Freud University, uh, he illustrated this insight by a little story of a patient, and I allow myself to tell it because I thought it was impressive. He told us about a male patient suffering from the Tourette syndrome. As you probably all know, the syndrome is a disorder that involves repetitive movements or unwanted sounds, the tics, that can't be easily controlled. For instance, you might blink your eyes, you shrug your shoulders, you blur out unusual sounds or even offensive words. Although there's no cure for the syndrome, treatments are available. However, in the special case, there was a problem. The patient was a highly gifted drummer in a band. It turned out that the medicine he had taken to control his tics made him awfully tired and severely affected his creativity to play his drums in a club during the weekend. And as he was really depressed about these side effects, he worked out a plan with his physician. He took his medicine during the week just in order to be able to work as a simple employee. During weekend, he stopped taking it and became the creative and even aggressive drummer, accepting his tics and uncontrolled movements, which he could integrate in his music. Thus, he simply learned to accept his limitations and took decisions within the limited frame he had learned to respect. Now, this cannot be called a good uh, example for determinism and against the ex existence of free will. It is probably just a good example that participants and observers' perspective, the subjective and the objective point of view, can complement each other. In fact, you can deny the freedom of will in theory, but in practice, you cannot but at least appeal to the free insight of someone else. If I became a radical determinist right away after listening to your lecture, Peter Lustig, I would prove simply by this conversion that there is no determinism. I admit, though, that this is not the last and best defense of the claims of determinism, of course. There is always the possibility that I'm caught up in a big, inescapable illusion caused by my brain. And maybe the whole um, thing with this moral enhancement yesterday is such an illusion. 
I don't know. This is just a question. A third and last comment to defend this freedom of will, Stefan Ernst, the former moral theologian at Würzburg University, rejects the idea that freedom is simply a matter of accident or groundless arbitrariness and insists on the existence of reasons which, in, which enable decisions. Freedom has to be considered in a positive way. Freedom of will becomes possible because we have good reasons to meet decisions. Good reasons do not cancel free decisions, but make them possible. Furthermore, freedom of the will is not just a matter of alternative options. Either we can give a rational reason for our option and our choice is necessary, not free. If we cannot name a criterion, our choice is neither necessary nor free. It is purely random. Taking this dilemma as a starting point, Stefan Ernst suggests to refer to Thomas Aquinas and his distinction between libertas exercitii and libertas specificationis. The first freedom is the fundamental exercitium of will, the fact that I want. The second one is the specific definition of the action of will, what I want. And in the Summa, Thomas goes even beyond these two concepts of freedom and talks about a fundamental freedom. The will stands in freedom vis-a-vis -vis each of the goods available for choice. Of course, for Thomas, the last final justification of this will lies in God. God created human being as oriented towards the good. And human being has the capacity to know that the good he likes to choose is relative and limited. As human beings, we are not forced to choose relative goods. We can reflect our wishes and can agree with what we want, but we don't have to. We don't even have to agree with the idea of moral enhancement. We can say no. We can relate to ourselves and gain a distance to our wishes. Now, of course, I don't want to sneak in God through the back door now. He is not a gap filler to defend the freedom of will. I just want to say that there could be a concept of the freedom of the will, which entails a way to identify two levels of brain activity. A first level where you can observe and describe the activities of the brain empirically. And I think we touched this yesterday and we touched this level, of course, today. But there is also a second level where you can describe the perception of an object which you can affirm or deny. Moral judgment is linked to neural activity, but cannot be reduced to it. In my opinion, this fundamental freedom Thomas is talking about is compatible with Damasio's insight about the role of emotions, and even compatible with the therapy you're voting for. Sometimes this Fundamental freedom prevent us from simply following our wishes by a bodily reaction and remind us of the fundamental freedom we have to decide differently. And here, of course, this is the level where therapeutic interventions could be accepted. It was Jacques Maritain and Carana who deepened this concept of fundamental freedom and developed the idea of the option fundamental. Beyond all the different single acts we decide to do, there is this fundamental option in the heart of a person, implying a quest for the good. It is not the sum of acts, but the transcendental moment underlying all these single acts we choose to do. Here we meet the fundamental decision which person we want to be, although we are often not even explicitly aware of it. This fundamental option manifests, manifests itself in many individual moral decisions. It is linked to the brain, of course, and at the same time, it goes much beyond. And here, I think we have reached the limits of neuroscience. The option fundamental cannot be described empirically from the perspective of the observer and is often not even accessible to the participant. Here, we finally touch the story neurosciences cannot tell us. Neither can the story be improved by stimulations of the brain determined by others. But here we have to discuss, of course, where is the line between therapy and enhancement. The secret of a person is touched here.
concerning her self-determination and her option fundamental for the good. So thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the discussion now. Mask somewhere here. So thank you for your response, Professor Walser. And now we have time for discussion. I would like to invite our two speakers to sit here in the red chairs and when they will speak to come to this pulpit because otherwise they wouldn't be covered by the camera. So will be the first one. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm not sure uh, if my question makes any sense at all. Uh, I was wondering if uh, could be different uh, regions of the world. For example, I mean, uh, is those aggression which is Natural and even totally the same as the aggressions, aggression which caused by the disease. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, hmm. The mechanism which I um, mentioned um, in with related to the orbital frontal cortex uh, somehow implies that the aggressive impulses are already there. And when the control is uh, insufficient, so, uh, so the orbital frontal cor cortex controls the impulses that are natural or hiding within us or, or within the brain. I don't want to get into this, where is the aggression uh, actually, um, yeah, where it's hidden. But um, so that's, that's, that's one case, but, but um, so, so that it's somewhere there um, and it just gets liberated or uh, released. Uh, but when I read, uh, like, uh, briefly, I went over the symptoms um, of um, the patients with Lyme disease that I mentioned last very briefly. Uh, this was really so bizarre that they had dreams and it seemed like really um, they had impressions and uh, images that they couldn't recognize. So, so then it's a question really, where did it come from? <laughs> it's a partly met metaphysical question because you know, if it's not there in the brain, where does, does it come from? But I just want to say that um, it's uh, really uh, something that looks almost foreign to the, to the person and they are themselves surprised. So their consciousness, yeah, they are shocked about, about the thoughts and uh, like, other bizarre, not only violent. So, so that's, I would say, pushing the limits of, of, of uh, neuroscience and mind and, and thought. Um, yeah, so somebody um, like looking at the Bible story, you could say with the weeds and the wheat, while in the night, yeah, the, what, is, what is there? The devil came and uh, so the put the put the uh, put the weeds in between the wheat. So so then that's another explanation, I guess. 
um, where does the evil come from? But uh, but it's definitely um, yeah. I cannot really say much more. The other thing is um, um, that comes to my mind is um, the old uh, electrical stimulation studies by Wilder Penfield, uh, Canadian uh, neurosurgeon, who stimulated electrically parts of the brain exposed uh, in patients with epilepsy. So they were not healthy people, but also in some of these um, evoked behaviors. Uh, artificially evoked, uh, the patients could clearly recognize that it's not their own doing, that it's something weird happening despite or independent of their own will. So um, again, I don't, don't recall uh, like violent or aggressive um, acts, but it's, it's quite possibly, yeah, I'm pretty sure with stimulation of the temporal lobe uh, of the brain that you can you can also uh, stimulate aggressive behavior. So <laughs> that's as my as much as as, as I, I can say. Um, um, so just what comes to my mind, aggression is of course an ambivalent thing yeah uh, artists that's why i mentioned vincent van gogh and other artists uh, their art sometimes lives from their aggressive impulses yeah so um aggression is is not necessarily always bound to severe um uh, and to severe sickness or disease, yes, that's what I want to say. And uh, I, have an, I have a question here because I thought so much about Phineas Gage, of course. Um, do you think that today there is a way of treating him, but by training other parts of his brain areas, uh, kind of social behavior training? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a that's a great question, and um, I am relieved that I already found an answer by people who thought about it for long. So I don't have to make it up. Um, when I when I read for this subject, I couldn't put it all in the lecture, but there is there is an article by, by an Australian professor Macmillan that's titled "Rehabilitating Phineas Gage." And it has a dual meaning in the title. One is rehabilitating his memory because he puts quite some evidence that the story, I mentioned it briefly, the story of the gauge was so many times retold that uh, teachers of neuroscience uh, or neurology or psychiatry have added stuff to it. And then when he looked at the facts at the reality, which I uh, really on, only mentioned briefly, um, he was not completely i mean there was some there was some um, return of his of his uh, social uh, responsibility and feelings and simple facts that he uh, traveled to chile and worked in chile as a stagecoach driver uh, and then macmillan says well driving in a foreign country uh, looking yeah, putting customers or transporting goods is quite a complicated job and there was a lot of planning and there was also responsibility so he was holding a job that was not to totally trivial it was not just some manual labor so so in fact even uh, let's say non-believers would say mother nature or whatever force but but was at work and um, and phineas gage was not really uh, that uh, macmillan says that some some of the textbooks all, almost put him as a like total drunkard, totally irresponsible, uh, really doing a lot of bad stuff because he would not think about the consequences of his acts. And he's rehabilitating Gage uh, in terms of his memory that, that it's not true, that just not enough attention was paid to, to the facts about his later short life, that he was good enough uh, or re recovered enough to, uh, to really uh, function in his, um, in his life and uh, have a job. And the, so the other is um, the other meaning is that this rehabilitation somehow not artificial but somehow just just uh, by life and um, trying to live and not hiding in a in a just interacting with people uh, just um, was was a rehabilitation let's say effect that restoring the normal uh, normal interactions and responsibility 
so today, of course, uh, we might uh, purposely try to uh, to, uh, to to do it, do it in a controlled manner and maybe more intensive. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm no there is tries to people with different um, behavioral trouble and disturbances to rehabilitate them to integrate them back into society but of course that's i don't know um, anything about this uh, in practical terms Well, um, I can give you only a short answer because because uh, it's really not something that I that I um, think about uh, on a daily basis. That's why I put it in the slide that I'm on the when I talk to uh, like uh, cognitive neuroscientists, I'm always saying I work on the most primitive uh, system in the brain, the motor control. Uh, which is not so primitive after all, but compared to uh, all these noble things like uh, cognition, uh, memory, attention, reasoning, and so on, it's it's primitive. And then, of course, these higher levels like free will and and belief and theology. Um, I'm definitely not a fan of reductionism, and I was just putting kind of positive evidence. Yes, there is some some uh, let's say causal relationship because between brain damage and behavior but it's that it's not sufficient as as my my uh, colleague uh, responded uh, so it doesn't explain everything and when it comes to these uh, to these um, uh, complicated abstract things i had an atheist friend who would like to argue and he collected this evidence about brain damage or brain stimulation also uh, having, causing people to have visions and you maybe heard that Hildegard of Bingen maybe only had uh, had uh, severe migraine and all the visions were just these visual patterns that uh, normally happen with people with migraine who have this visual phenomena um, uh, happening in, in front of their eyes. So, so my friend, yeah, of course, and the people with epilepsy have sometimes religious uh, feelings and kind of fits of of visions and um, be behavior. So, of course, he's as an atheist was saying, well, it's it's all it's all natural, and so it's it's boring, and don't uh, make anything out of it. But but I'm not a reductionist, so so I think okay, yeah. From the other side, it works. Yeah, it uh, somehow malfunctioning brain or stimulating brain artificially uh, can give rise to something that looks like a religious experience, but it doesn't re <laughs> explain uh, religious behavior and thinking and um, and belief and so on. So that's enough from me. <laughs> <laughs> I try to think about what to say. Um, yeah. Well, you know, this is exactly the point. Um, when I thought about why, why do I search for a book explaining the states of my daughter, I didn't consult, uh, I don't know, the priest or whoever, I consulted neuroscientists. And that was the point where I thought they, they always seem to have an explanation in the short version uh, you mentioned. Yeah, it's, I, I, I don't know if you know Gerhard Roth, probably you know him. And I, I read some books um, about these criminals. And, and in the end, you, you just stimulate brain area and then everything is okay. Um, you, this is how the argument goes in the end. And, and this is where I thought, well, I'm, 
I don't want to have a society in the end. This is, of course, a social ethical argument now. I don't want to have a society where um, people with, with all, yeah, who are, who are more than their brain, who, who react to their environment, who were shaped by the, the experiences they made with uncontrolled situations outside the laboratory in the world. Yeah? Uh, here is a point which I don't want to miss. And this is something um, yeah, which sometimes makes me angry in this short version. It's, it's just a good book, a way of book selling. Um, but uh, I learned from you that there, of course, uh, you have to be careful. But I don't know what you say to Gerhard Roth and all these neuroscientists. Do, do you see the same problem? I must say, it's actually this author, I maybe heard the name, but haven't haven't read the... The only person that comes to my mind is uh, like Richard Dawkins, yes, the evangelist of reductionism and scientism or whatever he calls it. I, I heard, I read quite an interesting commentary uh, to his persona and all his uh, like buddies, let's say, call it, that they in fact are also pushing their own religion because they are totally exceeding, they are taking a handful of facts, but then they are interpreting it and making conclusions and pushing uh, the conclusions very far beyond the limited facts. Uh, I, I did still do neuroscience research and there is always, it's always fuzzy, it's always complicated and the conclusions are uh, complicated and then there are alternative explanations. So I like even with coronavirus epidemics. Yeah, there is, the data is very complicated and I'm, I'm glad I'm not a politician because politicians are required to put forward simple things like decision, how we behave towards this virus in terms of society. And uh, science is not like that. And we don't know about coronavirus and we don't know about the brain, which is about trillion times more expensive, uh, more and more complicated. So, uh, so um, yeah, I, that's that's about what what I would say. Um, it's really um, overstepping. We have, like, as I said, a handful of facts, and we are uh, interpreting it and making conclusions that are going ten times further. So um, I, I also heard a nice uh, metaphor that whoever drinks from the cup of science drinks half of the cup, becomes uh, very enthusiastic, as we already heard about the manifesto. And so and the, the metaphor was it gets inebriated like with alcohol. But when you drink to the bottom of the cup of science, to the limits of our knowledge, then you actually become sober. And then you realize, yeah, uh, it's, it's a complicated story. And uh, we should be very careful about, about strong statements we have in terms of anything in science, including neuroscience and the brain and so on. So, First, I just want to take what you were uh, saying and explore about it. So scientific reductionism to, to say that only scientific data are true is kind of physical science. It's not a scientific proof of science. So it's kind of religious or metaphysical uh, science. Um, and I would like to ask you uh, what is your experience uh, on interdisciplinary dialogue? Uh, among scientific uh, area and then philosophical the theological area. So uh, I have some, uh, I see also some difficulties in methodology because there are different methodologies, uh, natural sciences and humanistic or philosophical reflection on the uh, experience. And but I, I'm most and now interested in your experience of your work with the colleagues from other fields. Is this interdisciplinary dialogue something that you see uh, a fruitful way forward, or you see also more students or uh, if we have some some problems in this field? Just 
<laughs> can be the first um uh, yes well um i'm not doing very much uh, in going very far in this interdisciplinary collaboration um, dominic already mentioned in my introduction that i collaborate with the school of theology here um, but that collaboration is quite complicated i would say uh, so um, I give them feedback. We have a joint. Uh, we have a joint project where I am uh, part of the part of the scientist team. But in practical terms, um, yeah, they have an advantage that uh, that the head of the team, Professor Tabel, uh, also attracts um, people with training uh, in uh, natural sciences. So we collaborate with, with one uh, biologist who is also a theologian, maybe, or uh, is, is it, is it, if that's appropriate, uh, or a graduate student in, uh, in this spirituality, um, the term is social and spiritual determinants of health. So that's already an interdisciplinary uh, PhD program where I'm on the faculty board. Uh, but in practical terms, I would say it, it's complicated. If I may take a step aside uh, to some simpler collaborations, we, we collaborate with musicians about how music education and uh, creativity training changes the brain. And there I feel uh, that is kind of going okay because I'm an amateur musician myself. And so I, and I've worked, I sang in a choir, which was like half of the members were professional musicians um, in terms of playing an instrument and as amateurs, they were singing. So, so there, I think it kind of works. And we already published a paper on this uh, creativity training, uh, how it changes the brain. But when it comes to something further, like the theology project that we are working on, um, yeah, it's, um, a lot of time is spent just um, explaining the terms and what do you mean by this and uh, so it's hard and we also have a little physical problem that the school of theology is here the medical school is several kilometers away so so just to meet and and talk about things uh, requires some planning um, so I'm sorry to say we have not pushed it very far, and uh, there is still a lot of work uh, as far as me pers my personal experience. Yes, I can only agree with this. Uh, the thing is, if you, I, I like to do um, interdisciplinary dialogue, and it is a rare occasion to have somebody you can ask, but if you prepare to really meet him or her, exchange these terms you were mentioning what do you mean by this it takes a lot a lot of time and i have the feeling that um, well <laughs> uh, university as it is today is actually not prepared for this you know we all have uh, you, you have this um, publication pressure much more than we have probably but still we have to uh, write the next publication the next publication we we often do not go really deep into it and and that's the problem of the environment today and there is another problem i think this is uh, a specific problem of theology today, um, at least in Austria or in German speaking countries, it might be different here. Um, there have been times where theologians were invited uh, to contribute to interdisciplinary discussions, but these possibilities have become very rare. Um, philosophy as a bridge between the humanities and theology um, is often characterized by people who reject the idea of God or religious ideas altogether. So this bridge is, is somehow cut now and um, the two worlds, they do not touch each other too often. This is my impression because there are so many um, prejudice. There is so much prejudice against theologians nowadays. Well, they, they are not capable of talking on a scientific level. Yeah? Uh, this is a real um, this is a real challenge at the moment for theology. 
and I don't, I do not know what's happening in the future. Uh, so if if we theologians are forced in the end to leave university, there will be no interdisciplinary dialogue on on this freedom of will, on the concept of God behind maybe. Yeah. Um, well, this is the price then. Uh, this this is our situation in Austria. <laughs>